É... Hoje a gente vai ter, só um minuto, hoje a gente vai ter graça, o grato prazer de receber Silvester Wojtkowicz. Deixa eu apresentar o Silvester. Silvester ele é psicanalista junguiano e possui a sua clínica particular. Wojtkowicz. Wojtkowicz. <risos> na cidade de Nova York. Ele foi graduado pelo CG Jung Institute de, New York, de Nova York, membro fundador do Jungian Psychoanalytic Association, onde ele atua como coordenador de seminários, analista de data e supervisor. O Silvestre é palestrante internacional e os seus principais temas são a psicologia arquetípica, imaginação e arte. Ele apresentou diversas conferências internacionais com trabalhos sobre Jung e arte, sobre Fellini, Bansky e a poesia de Hilke. Eu tive a grata alegria de conhecer o Sylvester em 2013, num jantar na casa do nosso amigo Michael Van Adams. Não sei se o Sylvester lembra disso. Foi um jantar extremamente prazeroso, onde a gente, entre cervejas e drinks, e outras tantas coisas podemos conversar, nos conhecer melhor. Silvester, é um grande prazer te receber. É, há muito que eu queria te trazer para a comunidade junguiana a fim de que ela pudesse melhor conhecer seu trabalho, sua leitura muito particular da relação do Jung com a arte. Para mim é uma grande honra ter você aqui conosco. Muito obrigado, tá? A palavra está contigo. Obrigado, Marcos. Uh, bom dia a todos. Uh, that... Bom, mais ou menos esse é o máximo de português que eu consigo falar. A minha apresentação vai ter três partes. A primeira parte vai ser sobre as ideias controversas de Jung sobre a, a arte, então eu trouxe muitas citações. Depois eu vou falar sobre o complexo de arte, o complexo artístico de Jung, baseado na sua relação com a arte, e depois disso eu vou mostrar alguns slides dos trabalhos de arte, artísticos de Jung e também de outros artistas do início do século XX. Eu vou discutir um pouco sobre Jung é, nas relações, é, com, nas, em suas relações com as ideias do início, final do século XIX, início do século XX. Então, eu vou agora compartilhar a minha tela com vocês. Espero que todos estejam vendo. Então, aqui são algumas citações para destacar as controvérsias, as ideias controvérsias de Jung com a arte. A mentalidade do inconsciente é instintiva, não tem funções diferenciadas e não pensa como entendemos o pensar. Ela simplesmente cria uma imagem que responde à situação consciente. Esta imagem contém tanto pensamento quanto sentimento e nada mais é do que um produto da reflexão racionalista. Essa, im essa imagem seria melhor descrita como a visão de um artista. É uma experiência artística que, no sentido mais profundo da experiência humana, é incompleta. A visão é experimentada artisticamente, mas não humanamente. Por experiência humana, eu quero dizer que a pessoa do autor não deve apenas ser incluída passivamente na visão, mas que deve enfrentar as figuras da visão de forma ativa e reativa, com plena consciência. Um acordo real com o inconsciente exige um ponto de vista consciente firmemente oposto. Pode-se entender a arte como um sonho, assim como um sonho busca manter 
o equilíbrio psicológico ao compensar a atitude consciente de urna através dos elementos inconscientes, do mesmo modo, a arte equilibra a tendência do público geral de um determinado momento. Devemos lidar com sonhos como uma obra de arte, não de forma lógica ou racional, como alguém que faça uma afirmação, mas com uma pequena restrição em algum lugar. É a arte criativa da natureza que produz um sonho. Então, devemos estar à altura quando tentamos interpretá-lo. Tenho preconceito apenas contra todas as formas de arte moderna. É principalmente mórbida e maligna na superfície. Quem fala em imagens primordiais fala com mil vozes. Ele cativa e domina ao mesmo tempo que eleva o of the occasional and the transitory into the realm of ever enduring. What can analytical psychology contribute to the mystery of artistic creation? Perhaps as art has no meaning, at least not as we understand meaning. Perhaps it's like nature which simply is and means nothing beyond that. Is meaning necessarily more than mere interpretation, an interpretation secreted into something by an intellect hungry for meaning? Art, it has been said, is beauty, and I think of beauty is a joy forever. It needs no meaning, for meaning has nothing to do with art. Within the sphere of art, I must accept the truth of this statement. Try to awaken the hidden artist who slumbers in every man. Give him a chance to bring to light the pictures he carries unpainted within himself, to free the unwritten poems he has shut up inside him, and yet another source of psychic disturbances is removed. Even though the work he produces will hardly ever amount to anything technically and artistically, it has helped to cleanse and release his psyche. Contemplation of abstract painting always starts me off on the following train of thought. It is not an object of experience in the outer world, nor is it meant to be. If, never, if nevertheless there are hints of something recognizable, this is an unintentional lapse or an unavoidable concession to the understanding of the beholder or to the desire to communicate. The process of, anti, uh, of artistic expression invests invest the bare fantasy with the element of reality, which rends its greater weight and greater driving power. And these rough and ready pictures do intend to produce effects, which I must admit are rather difficult to describe. A patient needs only to have seen once or twice how much he is freed from the wretched state of mind by working at the symbolical picture, and he will always turn to this means of release whenever things go badly for him. The patient can make himself creatively independent through this method. By painting himself, he gives shape to himself. I was jealous of Brock because he has succeeded. Brock was a German uh, writer, uh, wrote the, the Death of Virgil. Uh, be, because he succeeded in doing that, what I had to forbid myself on pain of death. Welling in the same netherworld maelstrom and wafted to ecstasy by the vision on unfathomable images, I hear the voice whispering to me that I could make it aesthetic. Although I knowing that the artist in words within me is the merest embryo incapable of real artistry, I would have produced nothing but a heap of shards which could never have been turned into a pot. In spite of this ever-present realization, the artist homunculus in me has nourished all sorts of resentments 
and has obviously taken it very badly that I didn't press the poet's wreath on his head. I can understand modern works of art only as idols from the underworld. And they become accessible to me only through a knowledge of psychology of the unconscious. They do not affect me aesthetically. It may very well be that my attitude is that of Philistine, but God knows I cannot find them beautiful. Perhaps other centuries will, in which case I'm thankful to the creator that man doesn't live for 200 years. Otherwise, he would suddenly find himself in an age in which he would choke to death. The creative process, so far as we are able to follow it at all, consists in the unconscious activation of an archetypal image and in elaborating and shaping this image into the finished work. By giving it shape, the artist translates it into the language of the present and so make it possible for us to find our way back to the deepest springs of life. Therein lies the social significance of art. It is constantly at work, educating the spirit of the age, conjuring up forms in which the age is most lacking. In art, for instance, the Negro, who was always thought was born a slave, who always thought was born a slave, is now the most admired artist. We admire this, his dancing. Negro actors play a great role. We find Negro spirituals exceedingly beautiful. We could not possibly tolerate the hypocrisy of other revivalist meetings, but in Negro spirituals, there's a living faith. There's something immediate and touching. Don't forget that from the Jews, the most despised people of antiquity, living in the most despicable corner of Palestine or Galilee, came the Redeemer of Rome. Why should not our Redeemer be a Negro? It would be logical and psychologically correct. And now the two for the ending here. Art represents the process of self-regulation in the, the life of nations and the epochs. And the next quote is what I taken in actual explorations of Jung writing and thinking about art. The Jung himself uh, uh, writes it down already in 1922, but he is not consistent in applying what he thinks that the proper attitude toward the, the artist should be. Quote, we must let a work of art act upon us as it acted upon the artist. To grasp its meaning, we must allow it to shape us as it shaped him. Then we also understand the nature of the primordial experience. He has plunged into the healing and redeeming depths of the collective psyche, where man is not lost in the isolation of consciousness and its errors and suffering, but where all men are caught in the common rhythm, which allows the individual to communicate his feelings and strivings to mankind as a whole. So this is, this is the end of the Jung quotes here. And now over this. Just a second, there's a technical difficulty here. Okay. 
Okay. Okay. So now I'll be talking about Jung's art complex. As Jung was engaged in his confrontation with the unconscious, resulting in fantasies described in his black books and elaborated in the red book, he heard an inner voice, inner feminine voice, calling his endeavor art. Sonu Shadmasani identified this voice as the voice of Maria Meltzer, a nurse at Bulgotsi Hospital, Jung's collaborator at the time, with deep interest in art. This inner voice made such an impression on Jung that he recounts his twice, once in his seminar in 1925 and then in the Memories, Dreams, Reflection in 1958. In the seminar on analytical psychology in 1925, Jung narrates Jung narrates this initial dialogue with the anima figure this way. While I was writing down my visions, once I said to myself, what is this I am doing? It's certainly not science. What is it? Then the voice said in me, that is art. This made a stranger sort of impression upon me because it is not in any sense that, that I, it's not in any sense my conviction that what I was writing was art. A living woman would very well have come into the room and said the very thing to me because she would not have cared anything about the discrimination she was trampling underfoot. Obviously, it wasn't a science. What then could it be but art, as though these were the only two alternatives in the world? That is the way the woman's mind works. End of quote. One can hear Jung's superiority over this feminine voice. So I have difficulty in moving slides somehow. So uh, his emotion does not let him notice that the very thing he's accusing the other of is his own thinking in opposites. This is the way Jung's ego mind works. The anima just says that what he does is art. Jung's ego it brings, brings the oppositional thinking. All he says is a result of his angry, fear-based reaction to her comment. Obviously, the anima voice strikes a chord with Jung, and he is afraid of its persuasive power. The core, this, this chord I call Jung's art complex. Jung continues, quote, Inasmuch as what I was doing was manifestly not scientific, I might have taken it for, for art, but I knew perfectly well that this was a wrong attitude. With a secret conviction that this was art, I could easily have watched the curse of the unconscious as if I would watch the cinema. If I read a certain book, I may become deeply moved by it, but after all, it is all outside myself. And in the same way, if I had taken those dreams and fantasies from the unconscious as art, I would have had from them only a perceptual conviction and would have felt no moral obligation for it. My anima would easily have worked me up to the state of believing that I was a misunderstood artist, privileged to cast aside reality for the sake of pursuing this alleged artistic gifts. End of quote. Jung has strong defensive reaction to the anima's opinions. He is not, there is no openness here to the voice of the other. Jung's mind is made in advance, made up in advance. 
Possessed by the complex, he goes on and on trying to shake any insinuation that he may be an artist, contradicting what he otherwise believed about critically considering the position of the other. Jung reacts to his, uh, from his art complex out of fear of being perceived as an artist and a misunderstood one for that. The way Jung thought of psychology included moral dimension. Thus, his identity as a psychologist has, even more, has been more acceptable to him than that of an artist. Ironically, being misunderstood became a self-fulfilling prophecy. Jung is paranoid about Anima's intentions and is terrified, quote, being ground to pieces, end of quote, but not by virtue of what he does, but, but by how his activity is categorized. It is as if Jung was afraid that if he accepted the Anima suggestion that he made art, he would end up like a mad visionary artist lost in his own fantasy world, unable to communicate with others by convinced of his own truth. More than three decades later, Jung narrates to Aniela Jaffe a slightly different version of his encounter with Anima. Quote, I once asked myself what I'm really doing. Certainly this has nothing to do with science, but then what is it? Whereupon a voice said in me said, it's art. Obviously, what I was doing wasn't science. What then could it be but art? I said very emphatically to this voice that my fantasies have nothing to do with art, and I felt a great inner resistance. Then came the next assault, and again the same question. This is art. This time I caught her and said, no, it's not. On the contrary, it's nature. The major difference in these two accounts is Jung's adamant assertion that his visions are nature. Jung ends his anima dialogue with the statement asserting dominance of the ego, quote, in the final analysis, the decisive factor is always consciousness, which can understand the manifestation of the unconscious and take the position towards them. Jung assigned to the anima a, po a position of conveying images to the, uh, of the unconscious and consulted her when his emotions were disturbed. He reluctantly obliged, she reluctantly obliged and responded with the image that could vanquish the sense of oppression and transform emotional energy into interest in an image. He striped the art, uh, his artist soul of his power and let his ego set the rules of the engagement. At the same time, Jung believed that he was fulfilling his ethical obligation towards the image. Actually, Jung, quote, fell prey to the power principle, the very condition that he himself envisioned would happen if he failed to consider images ethically. Despite his adamant op 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 opposition to designating his activity as art, Jung was compelled to write his fantasies down in the black book and then elaborated them artistically in the red book. Eventually, he abandoned his anesthetizing, what he called anesthetizing tendency, believing that such outpouring, outpouring of fantasy quote, needed firm ground underfoot and that he must return to reality, which for him meant scientific comprehension, end of quote. My science, he said, was the only way I had of extricating myself from chaos. I took great care to try to understand every single image, every item of my psychic inventory, to classify them scientifically and to realize them in actual life and to convert insight into them into ethical obligation. Given Jung's personal equation, scientific understanding was the only way open to him to develop psychology with the soul. The danger of succumbing to the inner world of his images was real to him and he feared that he 
lost that he get lost in his fantasies the way uh, Nietzsche perished uh, in what you call the quintessential horror of irreality. The belief that Jung was go- doing scientific work of a Jung protection against this horror of fantasy that the art would have not provided. By pinning down uh, butterflies of the soul, describing their habits and classifying them by species was creating the science of psychology, the logos of the soul. While Jung believed that the artistic attitude towards the images had not entailed the ethical and ethical obligation, his own approach to images reveals that there were some images towards him he felt more morally obliged than towards the others. Figures of Elijah and Philemon, for example, who Jung represented for Jung represented wisdom and meaning, were for him forerunners of the concept of the self and carried more way than homunculus of Ka, another character, or his artistic soul. This is Ka. Over the years, the anima has persisted on trying to convince Jung about the artistic value of his fantasy. At the end of the First World War, when Jung was a commandant of the uh, POW camp in Switzerland for the, for the English soldiers, from the First World War, uh, the anima, which was the, the Maria Meltzer, sent him a what he called dangerously persuasive letter that highly irritated him. It seeded the letter, seeded doubt in Jung's mind, quote, whether the fantasies he was producing were really spontaneous and natural and not ultimately his own arbitrary inventions, end of quote. It is as if giving aesthetic appreciation to his fantasy process meant for Jung devaluing it rather than enriching it. He categorized uh, this process as scientific experiment and any suggestion that there was artistic value in it threatened to turn what Jung believed was a natural expression of the unconscious into arbitrary egoic fabrication and as such put his whole psychology project into question. He was so disturbed by the anima voice that he's, he was drawing mandalas at the time. So they were, after this letter, he was so disturbed that his next mandala lost its symmetry, as he says. Paradoxically, after rejecting the artistic value of his mandalas, Jung concretized the value of his paintings and guarded them, this is his quote, guarded them like a precious pearls. Jung had to deny the suggestion that his anima voice, that he was engaged into art to preserve the integrity of psychology project. This is really important. He had to deny the suggestion that this was art because uh, that he wanted to preserve integrity of psychology project. Jung was terrified, quote, of being grinded to pieces, but not by virtue what he did, but how his activity was named or categorized. It is as if Jung was afraid that if he accepted the anima suggestion that he made art, he would end up like a mad visionary artist, lost in his own fantasy world, unable to communicate with others, but convinced of his own truth. For Jung, it was not an idle threat. Jung's friend and collaborator from the time of uh, uh, World Association experiments, Franz Ricklin underwent his own artistic anantidromia. Under the influence of the same Maria Meltzer, that psychiatric nurse at Burgosli, uh, Ricklin abandoned psychiatry and psychoanalysis about the time that Jung had his own confrontation with the unconscious in about 1913. Ricklin became a student of Augusto Giacometti, an out, uh, uh, uncle of Alberto Giacometti that we all know. Eventually, uh, Ricklin established a career as an abstract painter exhibiting at Zurich uh, Dada Group in 1919. As you know, the uh, Zurich was uh, one of the 
founding places of Dada, Cabaret Voltaire, and so on. So uh, he was exhibiting with them. In exchange with Erika Schlegel, a librarian at the Zurich Psychological Club, Jung appraised written art, quote, his smaller work had a certain artistic value, he says. His larger simply dissolved. He vanished wholly in his art, rendering his, him utterly intangible. His work was like a wall over which water ripples. He could therefore not analyze, as, as this required one to be pointed like a sharp-edged knife. He had fallen into art in a manner of speaking. But art and science are, were no more than the servants of the creative spirit, which is what must be, must be served. End of quote. Shamdasani comments that Rickling served for Jung as a kind of doppelganger, whose fate he was keen to avoid. Jung believed that it was an actual woman and not an anima figure who stood his friend from science towards art and felt vulnerable himself. He was afraid of similar fate given that her voice had a strong impact on him. Obviously, it was highly complex issue for Jung since he actually believed that the man could become an artist because of a woman and not out of his own inner predisposition. Jung did not want to take a chance to call his work art and became what he feared the most, a misunderstood artist. However, you know, Jung being Jung, uh, he was aware of the complex. Quote, I had much trouble getting along with my ideas. There was a diamond in me, and in the end, its presence proved decisive. It overpowered me, and if I was at times ruthless, it was because I was in the grip of the diamond. Quote. Uh, I could never stop at anything once attained. I had to hasten on and catch up with, to catch up with my vision. I had no patience with people aside from my patience. I had to obey the inner law which was imposed on me and left me no freedom of choice. Of course, it, it, it did not always, I did not always obey it. How can anyone live without inconsistency? A creative person has little power over his life. He is not free. He is captive and driven by his diamond. The diamond, the diamond manages things so that one comes through and blessed in consistency sees to it that in flagrant contrast to my disloyalty, I can keep the faith in unsuspected measure. When the diamond is at work, one is always too close and too far. Only when it is silent, one can achieve moderation. Although it is self-evident that the artistic expression of producing the Liber Novus or the Red Book has sustained Jung during his dark times, he could not bring himself to recognize the, this fact. He clung to his designation of the process as a scientific experiment and conceptualized his experience from that perspective. As a result, Jung developed his technique of engaging the psyche, active imagination. However, to preserve the originality and distinctness of his methods from art making, he had to minimize art's cognitive and semantic components. He had to emphasize the process and not the product of his effort. It allowed him to focus on the soul and its expression as images for their own sake and not for the sake of art. Given his art complex, Jung had to resist his anima voice in order to engage his creative material fully. Defining himself as a scientist, psychologist, working on the natural lava, what he called this early fantasies, that erupted from his psyche, gave him enough courage and libido to make it his life work. As, as if it was art, it would not carry for him the same interest, conviction, and significance as designating his psychology did. In retrospect, it is easy to cite 
with Jung's anima voice. However, what was at stake here was the relationship of psychology to the soul. How Jung had dealt with the materia was not an issue for him, but how it was categorized. If Jung engaged the material the way he understood an artist did, he might not have been able to claim the soul as a quintessence of the work as fundamentally as he did. It is as if the art complex compelled Jung towards psychology with soul. In this context, I believe that the rejection of the anima designation was a fateful, what I call the fateful error. It was the error that eventually led to the recognition of the autonomy of the soul and engagement with the images for their own sake and not the sake of the product or the ego. It took Jung decades, three, four decades, to fully grant fantasy the prominent position in the psyche. This is to, until the Mysterium <laughs> Conjunctionis. Paradoxically, Jung's limitation allowed the soul to claim the center stage and make itself present in psychology. If he followed the artist way, we might have had a soulful art, but soulless psychology. Now, a little bit about the Azazel complex, another complex that I think is sort of I I I interrupting Jung understanding of art. On June 17, this is, a, there will be a few images of the Azazel. Uh, on June 17, 1952, after just completing Answer to Job, Jung was interviewed by the Czech British art historian, J.P. Hodin. Quote, I cannot occupy myself with modern art anymore. It's too awful. That is why I do not want to know more about it. When modern art came on the scene, it presented a great psychological problem for me. Art derives its life from and expresses the conditions of the time. In that sense, art is prophetic. End of quote. Modern art seems awful to Jung, as if he had forgotten that is an accurate reflection of the horrifying times of the European history of the 20, early 20th century. He contrasts his own artistic endeavors with the modern art and acknowledges that the art presented a great psychological problem for him. Given his vision of art, quote, as a process of self-regulation in the life of the nations and epochs, a prophetic function of art, it was crucial for Jung to see modern art as reflective of and compensating for the psychological condition of modern life. Jung's quote-unquote great psychological problem with the modern art I call the Azazel complex. Let me elaborate a bit here. In answer to Job, following the apocryphal Hebrew scripture, the book of Enoch, Jung imagines origins of art and sciences. Quote, the fallen angels, among whom Azazel was particularly excelled, taught my, mankind arts and sciences. They proved to be extraordinarily ex progressive elements who broadened and developed man's consciousness. In this way, they enlarged the significance of man to gigantic proportions, which points to an inflation of the cultural uh, consciousness at that period. An inflation, however, is always threatened with the counter stroke from the unconscious. And this actually happened in the form of, of the deluge or the flood, end of quote. The name Azazel, Azazel derives from the Hebrew root Azaz, which is something to be strong, and El, the God, which has been translated variously as, a, as God has been strong, God strengthens, or strong one of God. It can figuratively mean impudence or the impudent of God, 
Alternatively, the name may reflect, refer to the rugged and strong mountain cliff from which the goat has been ca cast off in the scapegoat ritual. Scapegoat carrying the sins of the community was exiled into the Azazel land. Jung considered angels members of the strange, strange order of soulless beings representing, quote, nothing by the thoughts and intuitions of the Lord, who are precisely what they are and cannot be anything else. This is from Memories, Dreams, Reflections. Jung believed that the fallen, exclusively bad angels, begot inflation similar to megalomania that he observed in modern dictators. This is his metaphors. Fallen angels of the Book of Enoch can be seen as archetypal ideas incarnating in human experience that led humans to higher consciousness through development of arts and sciences. Jung thought that such search of archetypal energy leads to gigantic oversignification of creative individuals. He uses the curious expression, an inflation of cultural consciousness as if collective human experience was elevated excessively through creative expression. I call this inflation of the cultural consciousness the Azazel concept complex, and would argue that as a psychologist, Jung was on the mission to deflate and criticize any cultural manifestation that unduly raised significance of the ego of the psyche as a whole. Jung would see modern artists identify with the true creator, the archetypal Azazel. It was not just a megalomania of tyrants, uh, but even more so the notoriety and glorification of some modern artistic giants like uh, James Joyce or Pablo Picasso that became target of Jung's deflationary uh, uh, mission. It is as if by diminishing the statue of modern artists, Jung hoped to prevent another deluge. He believed that hubris of consciousness or taking man as the highest measure would lead to the universal catastrophe. Jung, particularly in his public essays, aimed at, quote, shrinking gigantism, hubris of the modern consciousness. True to the vision of Azazel, Jung considers both science and modern art evil. He judges them both guilty of, of irresponsibility with which they bring to the world their own inventions and expressions. At times, Jung's condemnation of evil, impact of the art, reaches a fever pitch, like on the eve of the Second World War, after all the Anschluss of Austria, uh, when a, spec a specter of Nazis hovered over Europe, Jung expressed these bitter remarks to the Protestant clergy in London. And this was in, in, in uh, May of uh, uh, 1939. He gave art, uh, we he says, quote, we have art galleries, yes, where we kill the gods by thousands. We have robbed the churches of their mysterious images, of their magical images, and we put them into art galleries. That is worse than killing of the 300 children in Bethlehem. It is a blasphemy." End of quote. Jung is positively enraged by the modern iconoclasm of divine images for splitting luminous images from the religious context, for separating art and religion. But as a psychiatrist, and based on his own experience, Jung had acute awareness of power or archetypal possession in what uh, Helderlin called godless destitute times. Quote, the contents that were formerly projected were now bound to appear as personal possession, as chimerical phantasm of the ego consciousness. The fire chilled the, to, to, to air, and the air became the great wind of Zarathustra and caused an inflation of consciousness, which it seems can be dumped down to the most terrible catastrophe to civilization, another deluge let loose by the gods upon inhospitable humanity. This is the, the inhospitable uh, humanity is an allusion to the murder of the Philemon in Bautzis in the second part 
of Faust of Goethe. Jung imagined himself as a successor of that mythical uh, couple of Baucis and Philemon and placed an inscription over the entrance to his Bollingen Tower. Philemon is sacrum Fausti Ponitentia, or the Temple of Philemon, Repentance of Faust. Jung took upon himself to provide the sanctuary for gods in his life work and to educate the public to pre prevent the inflation of consciousness. Given his understanding that the archetypal context inflating the contemporary ego consciousness are to blame for the 20th century horrors, as debatable this, this notion can be on the social political scale, but that was Jung's belief, Jung looked for Alice among people who deal with the creative symbolic process for artists to provide the symbols that would shift the zeitgeist. Quote, it seems to me of some importance, therefore, that a few individuals or people individually should begin to understand that there are contents which do not belong to ego personality, but might be ascribed to the psychic non-ego. This mental operation has to be undertaken if we want to avoid a threatening inflation. To help us, we have the useful and edifying models held up to us by poets and philosophers, models or archetypi that we may call remedies for both men and the times." End of quote. Jung was disappointed that modern artists have not come with the unifying symbols, only with alienating fragments and ruins of meanings, beauty and value. In his view, modern artists are not aware what archetypal forms were expressing themselves through their work. As he put it to Margaret Tilly, an English concert pianist, pianist that visited him in 1956 regarding music, quote, I never listen to music anymore. It exhausts and irritates me because music is dealing with such an archetypal material and those who play it don't realize it, end of quote. In general, Jung believes that modern art is a blind guide to the unconscious. Although in his late essay, The Undiscovered Self from 1956, he grants art ability of psychological education and considers it art full of meaning. Quote, though seeming to deal with aesthetic problems, modern art is really performing a work of psychological education on the public by breaking down and destroying the previous aesthetic views of what is beautiful in form and meaningful in content. This tells us in plain and universal language that the prophetic spirit of art has turned away from the old object relationship towards, for the time being, dark chaos of subjectivisms. Certainly art, so far as we can judge of it, has not yet discovered in this darkness what is that could hold all men together and give expression to their psychic wholeness. Since reflection is needed for this purpose, it may be that such discoveries are reserved for other fields of endeavor. I guess he means the analytic psychology. Jung complains that modern art has not yet found a new form of human solidarity and expression of wholeness. He believes that the only depth psychology can provide reflection needed for wholeness. He does not have his usual patience regarding the emergence of symbols from the unconscious. For all his praise of modern art prophetic spirit, he does not want to wait for the emergence of the unifying symbol from the chaotic subjective darkness but he wants to deposit it through reflection. It is as if he believed that psychological reflection could penetrate beyond prophetic spirit of art and detect wholeness somehow. However, no reflection can discover its object. It can only posit it 
its existence. The object still needs to emerge by itself to be manifest. This reflection is not reflection in a strict sense, but what I call holos algia, or longing for wholeness, from the Greek word holos for whole and algos or pain, sorrow or longing, like nostalgia, longing for return home. Uh, that, that, so this is holosalgia, longing for wholeness that aims at wholeness prior to its emergence. In his approach to art, Jung does not have the same humility and respect that he has towards patient's material. He just applies his theory of opposites and claims the fragmentation that the fragmentation calls for wholeness. But even then, the wholeness will not discover it will be discovered only when manifested, not when posited. He does not recognize that modern art and intelligibility itself points to the symbol as the best expression of something that is not yet otherwise understood. And he's upset that artists have not yet produced a symbol of the wholeness and portray only chaos and fragmentation. If only Jung had ventured a bit closer to what mod modern artists, he would see them as fellow wrestlers with the inner diamonds attempting on their own without prior models to truly enter the unconscious to bring back symbols of transformation. Quote, the man therefore who driven by his diamond steps beyond the limits of intermediary stage truly enters the untrodden, untreatable regions where there are no charted ways and no shelter spreads at protecting roof over his head. So now I'm going to move to Jung on the background of modern abstract art. So I have had to change the slides here. And uh, I will take a couple of minutes. Hold on here. Uh, Let's see whether this will work. Okay. The turn of the 20th century brought radical changes in European spirit. Across disciplines, profound shifts were taking place. Mathematics explored non Euclidean geometries. Physics was moving from Newtonian to Einstein theories. Chemistry experimented with radiation. Western music was transforming from classical to atonality and 12-tone technique. Jazz was being born. Psychoanalysis was emerging and diversifying. Artists were experimenting with abstraction. Imperial politics were brewing the First World War. All these synchronous changes can be seen as an expression of the same zeitgeist. Lux Moderna, the modern light. I consider the emergent Jung's analytical psychology as yet another manifestation of these transformations of the spirit. In my presentation, I will focus on the parallels between Jung's unintentional artistic legacy and the abstract art of the period. As Jung wrestled with the spirit of the times and the spirit of the depths to fathom and find a form of, for what is to come, Modern artists were engaged in their own spiritual struggles to express invisible in art. 
German Dadaist Kurt Schwitters developed an understanding of an artistic meaning, image. Quote, the picture is a self-contained work of art. It refers to nothing outside of itself. That is remarkably similar to Jung's appreciation of the fantasy image from Mysterium. Quote, above all, don't let anything from outside that does not belong get into it for the fantasy image has everything it needs. End of quote. Through his research on archetype and amplification, Jung was accustomed to treat art objects, painting and sculptures instrumentally for purpose of identifying timeless universal patterns and symbols. These artistic artifacts were only interesting for him for their usefulness to support his theory or to um, amplify the archetypal themes and not in their artistic import. They were treated like the dreams of his patients or, or rather their amplifications as manifestation of the unconscious and expression of archetypal images. Jung emphasized their symbolic meaning and manifestation of the creative spirit and not their aesthetic value or artistic skill. In the psychology of the unconscious or symbols of transformation, uh, the book contains dozens of photographs of sculptures, engravings and paintings illustrating archetypal themes. In his own active imagination in Liber Primus, when Jung described figures he saw flashing in the crystal, like Mary, Eve, St. Peter, Buddha, Kali, he instantly recognized them. In order for, imag for his imaginal perception to be accurate, as the figure did not explicitly identify themselves like other figures did, like Elijah, Salomon, or Philemon, they basically introduced themselves. The figures that he saw in the crystal might have been represented in their iconic form. That is, as, as they were depicted in out of the centuries. Otherwise, how you would recognize them, you know, like Mary shows up, it's like any woman, but because of the iconography of the Christian uh, for the centuries, you can, you can recognize Mary immediately. Jung was interested in the symbolic meaning of art as expression of psyche and not in its aesthetic value. Thus he believed that modern artists were unaware of the symbolic meaning of their work. Quote, it is rather conspicuous that creators of modern art are unconscious of the meaning of their creators, of their creations. End of quote. It is as if Jung considered art as incomplete active imagination, only the expressive part without attempt to understand its meaning. I argue that with regard to his own artistic endeavors, Jung was so focused on their meaning that he ignored or was unconscious of their aesthetic value and dismiss them as aestheticists. For all his critique as misunderstanding of modern art, Jung was prone to grand declarations about art. For example, it is indeed a law of painting to give visible shape to the dominant trends of the age. Of the age. And for some time, now painters have taken as their subject the disintegration of form and the breaking of the tables, referring to the Moses tables, creating pictures which abstractly detached from meaning and feeling alike are distinguished by their meaninglessness as much as by a deliberate aloofness from the spectators." End of quote. Jung's appraisal of modern art was distorted by his art complex and he would not apply to art his paradoxical understanding discovered in the Red Book that meaning and absurdity belong together in the psyche. Quote, the development of modern art with its seemingly nihilistic trend toward disintegration must be understood as the symptom of, the, of a mood of universal destruction and renewal that has set its mark on our age. End of quote. Thus he considered his approach aiming more, more at renewal than destruction. Jung's attitude to modern art was expressed succinctly in letter to Sarah Richards, a Welsh uh, artist painter, quote, I have no relation to modern art unless I understand the picture, end of quote. Definitely in relation to art, Jung privileges understanding over other modes of expressions, like feeling or aesthetic appreciation. 
Jung focused on the aspect of modern art that expressed fragmentation and disintegration, as his analysis of, of uh, Marcel Duchamp's New Descending the Staircase, on the critical essay on Picasso as a test, but ignored or was unaware of the emergent spiritual abstraction in art. Jung was firmly convinced that the modern art comes from the unconscious. Quote, there can be no doubt that the unconscious comes to the surface in modern art and with its dynamics destroys the orderliness that is characteristic of consciousness, end of quote. He compared it to episodic or regular disruption of the accustomed order and regarded it, quote, as a psychohygienic measure, giving, quote, vent from time to time to the suppressed forces of chaos, end of quote. However, he considers modern art as an opposite of art. He comes up with such a category, since it lacked the order and form. At best, he gave modern art a value of clearing the air by abolishing the constraints of orders. He hoped with holosalgia, which is longing for wholeness, uh, th that it's a transitory state, that the uprushing chaos seeks new symbolic ideas, which would embrace and express not only the previous order, but also essential contents of the disorder, and will have a magical effect of holding the destructive forces of disorder spellbound, as been the case in Christianity or other religions." End of quote. As you can hear, Jung considers art as having a religious purpose and grants its magical, apotropaic, meaning the averting evil, function. So it is really troubling to him that modern art does not fulfill its traditional role. That is, if modern art is not art, because it will not spellbind the forces of chaos and instead displays disorder, while true art would express wholeness. He considered it black magic, even. That's his uh, designation, quote, that exalts the destructive forces into the only valid truth, end of quote. He even applies the epithet infernal to long stretches of modern art and its form. Although Jung approvingly uh, quotes Voringer, uh, who wrote the abstraction and empathy that Jung devotes the whole chapter in the psychological types, well, the urge to abstraction is the origin of all art. He immediately undermines this statement with the pathologizing reflection. Quote, this idea finds weighty confirmation in the fact that schizophrenics produce forms and figures showing the closest analogy with those of primitive humanity, and not only in, in their thoughts, but also in their drawing. End of quote. Thus Jung bemoaned the modern artist's attitude toward abstraction, quote, the prophetic spirit of art has turned away from the old object relationship towards, for the time being, dark chaos of subjectivism. It seems that Jung ignored, quote, or uh, was unaware of spiritual currents among early abstract artists whose ideas were similar to his own. It makes me wonder how would Jung regard the abstract geometric art with the simple geometric order, absence of fragmentation, and distinctly defined color shapes of, of the early spiritual abstract art. Would he see it as a display of the pure spirit, a form of wholeness, or a fulfillment of the goal of modern art as he expected and like the artists themselves believed it was? So now we're moving to the, to the last part. Which, sorry, let me just stop share. And just a moment, I have to arrange the show. Uh, yeah.
1939, oh, sorry, <laughs> in 1911, this is that, you know, unconscious jump to the war, I guess. <laughs> in 1911, unbeknown to Jung, Vasily Kandinsky, in his seminal essay on the spiritual in art, wrote, the great epoch of spiritual, which is already beginning, or in the embryonic form, began already yesterday, provides and will provide the soil which a kind of monumental or work of art must come to the fruition. In, in the, the fervor to the exhibition in, in Los Angeles uh, County Museum of Art at uh, El Paolo, it was published in the catalog, Spiritual in Art, Abstract Painting from 1890 to 1995, states that in 1890s, interest in the occult and mysticism fused with the genesis of abstract painting, then it's in its embryonic form. Hilma of Klint of Sweden, a couple of paintings by her, Vasily Kandinsky in Germany, Francisek Kupka, what is now Czech Republic, but at that time was a Habsburgian Austria, Hungary. Kazimir Malevich in Russia. And Piet Modrian in Holland created a pure abstract vision that embodied the involvement with esoteric thought. Already at the same time when these things were emerging, the American uh, art critic, Arthur Jerome Eddy, identified the goal of contemporary art uh, as, quote, the attainment of the highest stage in pure art. In this, the remains of the practical desire are totally separated or abstracted. Pure art speaks from soul to soul. It is not dependent upon one use of objective or imitative forms. The forms used are necessary to express a spiritual content. The result is a living work of art. The, the world reverberates. It is a cosmos of spiritually working human beings. The matter is living spirit. And you can hear sort of echoes of how Jung thinks about these things in other places. Similar ideas emerging in the art world at the time when Jung was engaged in his Red Book, like Jung in psychology, contemporary artists and critics advocated art that spoke directly to the soul, was capable of expressing spirit and had cosmological impact and questioned duality of matter and spirit. Our current understanding of abstract art as non, quote, non-figurative subjective expression, art that does not attempt to represent external reality, but seeks to achieve its effect using shapes, forms, colors, and textures. This is from the Tate Art Gallery website. Is a result of over 100 years of art history and reflection. My favorite definition of abstract art is over 60 years old, formulated in 1952 by an American art critic and philosopher, Harold Rosenberg, in his classic essay, The American Action Painters. He understood abstract expressionists as a movement when artists stopped, quote, trying to paint art, like what Cubist and post-expressionists did, and decided, quote, to paint decided to paint, just to paint. The gesture on the canvas was a gesture of liberation. Liberation from value, political, aesthetic, and moral." End of quote. It seems to me that has taken more than a generation for artists and critics alike to come to terms with abstraction as abstraction, with abstraction as such, to say that the painting was not about something, but about paint, painting process, color, and form. Prior to such 
contemporary appreciation, some ideological validation of the value of abstraction from beyond the aesthetic dimension was required to legitimize the abstract painting. Usually such reason took form of spiritual aesthetics, expressive the invisible Foucault form. Kandinsky in this essay on the spiritual in art goes to great pains to distinguish spiritual art from simply decorative uh, art or just ornaments. Quote, the terrifying abyss of questions, a wealth of responsibilities stretched before me and most important of all, what is to replace the missing object? The danger of ornament revealed itself clearly to me that that semblance of stylized form I found merely repugnant. So he, they go to theosophy and anthroposophy to try to find additional sort of support for what they were doing. Now, 60 years later, German artist Sigma Polke playfully criticized this mystical period in a painting that is called, as it says here in German, higher powers command paint upper right corner, corner black. This work suggests that 60 years later, abstraction stood firmly on its non-representational ground and neither needed to represent the invisible not to be guided by spirit to exist and have value. In 1984, Frank Stella expressed his skeptical view on the spiritual ideology of early abstract art. I have no difficulties, he said, appreciating up to, and up to a point understanding the great abstract painting of the modernist past, the painting of Kandinsky, Malevich and Mondrian. But I do have trouble with the edicta, the pleadings, the defense of abstraction. My feeling is that these reasons, these theoretical underpinnings of theosophy and anti-materialists have done abstract painting a kind of disservice which has contributed to its present day plight. Today, we tend to view abstract painting as something completely autonomous that does not need any external narrative to legitimize it. And we considered Jung's illustration to the Red Book uh, art, as the recent publication of the art of Sijin Jung confirms. Let me end with this quote from Jung. The psyche does not trouble itself about categories of reality, for it's everything that work is real. In psychic life, as everywhere in our experience, all things that work are reality, regardless of the names man chooses to bestow on them, the names, the categories. To these realities, to take these realities for what they are, not forcing other names on them, that is our business, to take these realities for what they are, not foisting other names on them, that is our business. Now let me end with, this, end with this paraphrase of Jung. To the psyche, art is not less art for being named nature or science. Art is psyche. Obrigado. And now we move to the discussion. Muito obrigado, Sylvester. Um belíssimo trabalho, longo percurso, muitas questões, eu imagino, para a gente poder é, conversar <risos> com você. Só, novamente, apresentando é, as regras. Quem quiser fazer uma pergunta, bota o um nome no chat, eu chamo a pessoa e a pessoa faz a pergunta. Silvestre, vou começar com duas questões que, eu, que me, me apareceram durante a tua fala. É, okay, na tua... ok. Na tua opinião, é, o que poderia ter acontecido com a psicologia junguiana 
se a resposta de Jung à voz da ânima tivesse sido uma resposta positiva, se ele tivesse dito sim, isto uhum. é arte. E o desdobramento seria uhum. o pensamento junguiano contemporâneo continua respondendo a essa pergunta da ânima, dizendo que não, não é arte? Qual é a sua opinião? Oh, I mean, I was trying to suggest that, that this was this was the fateful error that Jung did not follow the voice of the anima, but continued to insist that this is nature, or sometimes he would call it art, I mean, science. Because if he did this, if he call, went with the anima voice, first of all, he would be afraid that he become the artist, like his friend Franz Rickling was and he felt like in this quote that from Brock that I presented that his artistic ability basically poetic and 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 uh, uh, sort of painterly was not enough to to claim what he was doing art and also his sort of belief in art was was limited versus belief in psychology so that if he considered it art he would not be able to continue with the same insistence that he did, you know, for the kind of consistent approach to create uh, the, you know, his psychology project or, or, or psychology with the soul. So in a way, as, as you know, every complex has two sides to it. You know, one is kind of a limiting and another is actually prospective. It guides you towards something. So even if he has the art complex, it guides him towards something that that if he considered it art would not be happening for him. Now, if you read my essay on the art complex that has a lot of details in it, Jung's basic the attitude towards art was kind of 19th century representational art that he uh, that he uh, uh, sort of established in his childhood. You know, from the from the uh, kind of exposure that he had in his you know, personage of his father, that he had a, only a couple of paintings there. And then his aunt introduced him to the, to the uh, sort of uh, art of antiquity and, and, and basically was uh, 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 quite uh, upset that Jung was watching the naked sculptures, you know, of the, from the, from the uh, uh, ancient Greece. So the, for him, that sort of the, the uh, 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 I would say the ethical component came to, to the art, that appreciation is fine, but once you start to call it, you know, it becomes sort of delicate, you know, in some sense. So I don't know whether that answered the, the, the question, but I think that now we can look at Jung's uh, uh, work, and I showed you a lot of, you know, most of the, the first part that, you, that you've seen, these were just paintings and sculptures of Jung. And you make your own judgment. And you know, Jung's family published this book, Art of C.G. Jung, that and there was a conference in Santa Barbara a couple of years ago on the on that sort of very subject, in which a lot of people, including artists and art historians, sort of look at Jung's uh, works, and you know, pretty much they're not so different. Then I, I use this sort of presentation of Jung's artwork on the background of other artists to see how similar, just formally speaking, you know, uh, Jung's paintings of the Red Book are to the, what, what was at that time abstract uh, uh, spiritual art. Algumas perguntas aqui. Bonita. Bonita Miranda. Ok. A Bonita vai falar. Espera aí. Pode ser, Bonita? Ok. Show, show, show. Não, isso. I don't care. Bonita, está fechado o seu microfone. Sorry. Uh, obrigado. Obrigada, Mar. Ok. Obrigada, Silvestre. Prazer te receber, por uma, Preta. Por uma uh, riquíssima palestra. Posso fazer minha pergunta para ele em inglês mesmo? Uh, sure, eu preferi que você fizesse... Pode ser? Então, tá. 
Pode, ah, pode. Exatamente. Obrigada, Isa. É só porque... É, ok. Então, so, se tiver... All right, ok, ok, vou mudar para inglês. Ok, okay. Sylvester, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask it in, in, in English, just because oh. I am sort of more used, I've done all my research on the Red Book in English, so I feel more comfortable. Oh. Sure. My, my question to you is, I was wondering that uh, arguing or even questioning Jung's definition of himself as an artist or not an artist, or mainly saying that I am not an artist, Yes. Bring us further away from his experience on the Red Book. Because this is a statement. How can we kind of question a statement? In a way, I think the invitation, invitation in the Red Book is for us to join his experience and look at his images as expression of his soul, not as art, even though there is an artistic wow. component to it. But to say that this is a symbolic expression of my soul, would you come in the journey with me? So this was the, 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 the feeling yeah. that the questioning yeah. brought me further away from his experience than into the experience. Could you comment on that, please? Okay. You know, yes, obviously the, the Red Book is a, is a many things. You know, one of them is... Has a... So the, you know, the artistic sort of elaboration with the, all the medieval German Gothic manuscript and, 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 the, and the illustration there has a, one component. Obviously, there's a content to it that, that is also quite profound. And it's, in that sense, is not artistic. I only argue that, that the art, to look at it as art, even as a, as a, you know, as a book itself, as an art, enriches it rather than diminishes it. So it's a psychology and an art and the, and the personal equation and then Jung struggles with his soul and so on, everything together. So the designation of it as art does not diminish it. Actually, for me, it, it values it. Now imagine, I, you've probably seen the black books. If the, if the, I mean, black books is a terrible thing. I mean, in terms of, you know, publishing it because why would you do, you know, 100 pages of the Jung's manuscript with no pictures and then sort of translation of it? You know, it's like you, you, you can see a few pages how Jung's writing looks and the rest, you don't need that. So if the black books were published first, it will, nobody will notice. And because the, the, the richness of this heavy, you know, whatever, 15 pounds volume, it, it, it comes up with the illustration that's what makes the splash. So, so the artistic value of the of the of the red book is what actually makes it important. Otherwise, the black books people will not probably read. And it's like, first of all, too expensive, actually, even more expensive than the, than the red book. So I think that for me, art enriches any any project. No, I totally agree with you, but the point is that the visual part yes. is a non-verbal expression of the active imagination that was written before. So he illustrated it to support visually so that you could have both, like the two hemispheres of, of, of the brain, a verbal and a non-verbal. So he brings a third so that the reader can have an experience either by looking at it or by listening. To the, no, to the words. I agree with, with that I mean. element. However, it, it, it seems to me that the the uh, uh, the way the red book is structured does something different than the black book. I'm right now teaching on the black book, so the, the, the that dynamic that is in the red book that Jung expresses uh, in, in 1916 transcendent function essay is that so he has the fantasy. And then has an understanding of it, and then moves with its understanding to the next fantasy. So he, through understanding what happened, he changes, the Jung's ego changes, and some of the characters will change. And then the next fantasy moves to a kind of, to further, you know, other level of consciousness. That's not the case. The black books do not have the reflection. Red book is, he, he develops a year and a half later, and one of the reasons that he says that he is not published the transcendent function essay and, and kept in his drawer for 40 years was because it was not he was not fully committed to that. So I wonder now 
in the in the whole aspect of you see when he talks about active imagination in the early essays in 1922 about uh, analytical psychology and poetry he tries to distinguish that process from art making so he in the process he devalues artistic creation I imagine that you know something about art. When the artist works with the studio, it's, it's full process. It's not just a, you know, it's just putting something, you know, you know, a, a sort of from the unconscious, not knowing on the canvas, but it's choices, it's thinking, it's regulation, it's a history of art and all kinds of things. So it's a lot of process that goes to art. But Jung wanted to make a distinction because this is the being of psychology and psychology has to differentiate itself from sociology, from religion, from biology and mm -hmm. so on. So he has to, in some sense, not just him, every other psychologist that was doing it at that time, because this was not a science yet. So it's, it's, it's overreacting, I think, and he has to make distinctions. So it's not art. What I'm doing here is different, but it's, I don't think that that distinction mm -hmm. can stand the sort of the 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 uh, the time, you know, when we sort of reflect on it more deeply, and I think that attitude, the attitude considering the, the you know art as something less, affected attitude of Jungians later on towards art. It was always funny to me to see. It. So we go to the international conferences, and what the analysts do besides, you know, presenting there and talking with friends, they go to the art museums in the cities in which they, the, the conference take place to, to see the art, to somehow. So the art has been a nourishing, uh, a nourishing uh, quality for the, for the Jungians to engage, but in terms of how they perceive the art as a something less than in, in, in their work is, is, for me, somehow part of the sort of complex in it. And th there's an Italian, you may know, Italian uh, uh, analyst, uh, Francesco Don Francesco, who wrote a, a, a book about it and presented a beautiful essay in, in, in 2001 in, in uh, Cambridge on that attitude of Jungian analyst towards art, towards partic particular artistic image. That's my take on it, so. Thank you very much. Obrigado, Bonita, pela tua presença também, tá? Seja bem-vinda. Wagner, contigo. Meu. Oi, tá me ouvindo bem, filho? Tranquilo? Então, é, eu gostaria de fazer uma pergunta ao professor Silvestre, o seguinte, é, a fala dele me trouxe algumas reflexões é, interessantes sobre a questão da modernidade. Aham. Uhum. Então, eu acredito que o grande legado do Jung né, seja justamente né, a proposta de um caminho para um encontro com a alma. Né? Então, vemos nos dias de hoje né, uma crise de sentido, né, onde os diversos cenários do humano, eles parecem não trazer nenhuma perspectiva satisfatória. Né? As religiões, as expressões artísticas, elas parecem desvitalizadas, né? Então, diante desse quadro, será que nós poderíamos né, pensar um retorno ao homem arcaico, né, no sentido de deixar-se sensibilizar, no sentido de deixar-se ser tocado pelo espírito das profundezas, para que a alma se expresse e possa oferecer ao homem contemporâneo os símbolos da totalidade? Obrigado. Yes, I mean, no, uh, but I am not sure, you know, the, the whole issue, what I call the holostalgia, that longing for wholeness, that it's throughout Jung's work. And when we talk about individuation in general, he's saying that this is, this is kind of a work in progress. Nobody is fully individuated. So it's kind of a direction, it's almost the ideal. So the individuating in this sense, moving towards the, the, the wholeness is a, is, a, is a kind of life project, I would say, that we have definitely with the Jung's development of the concept based on his experience, a lot of ideas that other fields don't have. Even, I think, 
re religion does not have that kind of a way of of talking about it that that we have because one thing that Jung does in the in the uh, the, the whole the process of the red book is to 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 look at the what he calls later the religious function of the psyche. So there is the there is a process. If we look also on the history of humanity, if we look at the at the art of the of the cave paintings from Lascaux and Tamira from now Indonesia, that that it seems that at that time everything was together, meaning the art and the religion and the meaning and life and uh, sort of shamanic deep experiences. This was all part of it. As civilization develops, all these things become separate. So the the art is in one box, you know, psychology is there, and then there, there is a you know religion. So coming from the from the position of the soul, in the soul everything is in some sense together. Only our categories. Oh, this is religion. I don't go there. You know, like Jung says, I am not a metaphysician. You know, that's not my issue. But he is metaphysician because in order to speak about the, the this sort of important questions, you have. Uh, uh, you know, uh, enter into this territory. What is real? What is what is real value? What it means to be human? How how we are? You know, becoming who we are. So these are all the, the same questions, but the, there are these different kind of prejudices, I would say, that come from the spirit of the time that Jung tried to to avoid. I would say. I don't know whether that satisfies your question. Okay. Obrigado, Wagner. Renato, Bandola, está aí, Renato? Uh, ou eu leio a sua pergunta? Ok. Oi, Marcos. Pode ir, pode ler. Per... Oi, então. Pode, pode ler, sim. Posso ler? Sim. Então tá. No livro Psicologia do Inconsciente... Eu não ouvi Uh -huh. Mais de viver o homem menor. A meu ver, talvez ele tenha tido essa dificuldade o seu homúnculo. Uh-huh. I mean, if he had a better artistic talent, you mean, then, then he would uh, engage it more or recognize it as, as art? Because he perceived it that he had uh, like this limitation in, in his artistic... Uh, you know, skills simply. So if he had a better sense of that, that then he would. No, uh, a, a pergunta foi assim, né? No caso, é, até que ponto, né? O Jung ele ele se recusou a olhar a arte de, dessa forma, né? De uma forma expressiva e não necessariamente unifica, unificadora, né? É, justamente por talvez querer não não talvez não não se abrir para a vivência desse homem menor que é o mesmo homem menor que ele fala no psicologia do inconsciente que é a maior dificuldade das pessoas né então como o Silvestre colocou é, ele de alguma forma ele ele nomeava uhum. esse artista de homúnculo né e homúnculo é uma imagem alquímica e né de yes. inferioridade, né? digamos assim. I, I, no, I generally think that Jung's interest in art was marginal. It, it looks, uh, you know, because you, once uh, you, you look at it and, you know, I basically look at every mention that you had on art, that it's a lot of, but in comparison to other things, it was not so important for him. 
and and I think and and basically he was doing psychology and was you know had very you know after this sort of struggle with anima he overcame the doubt that this is this is art so he didn't think much about it and I think that's the reason the complex of the it, it, it could show itself there because he he didn't care as much about it I would say as about other things let's say even religion so so that that was that was in my sense that was the reason of that it was it, it was not a major interest of Jung that that you know what was art he he was that was on the periphery of what he was in, in, in engaged with the soul was important and the the expressiveness you know is important i like his definition of psychology from the from the vision that for him psychology is simply a, a method for release and realization of experience that's it. it to let basically the flow of libido which for him meant the fantasies once that established once there is no uh, sort of repression if you wish things just flow in and 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 that's and then you you are fine you just recognize you instead of from ego position defending against it or something just be open to it and go through it and express it and feel it through and that's it and realize it's some form in life obviously that that's uh, and so that that aspect there was definitely the aspect of inferiority that if he said if i were to be misunderstood artist that would be a disaster and at the end of his life he feels like, like a misunderstood psychologist and he sort of he feels better with that you know misunderstood artist would be like a really marginal sort of you know as you know there was a lot of there was a movement of outside artists at that time so you would be basically outside artists and in the exhibit i think in in at, at the vienna biennale in 2011 uh, the, the the jung's book was placed in a temple in a way the red book was as a as a part of the of, of the exhibit of the contemporary art so you know that's that's a kind of the almost re-evaluation re of of inferiority in a way so it was more the young personal equation that was seeing this as inferior while we can now you know the even the culture in general can look at it that this is something artistic book of hours of the contemporary times let's say you know Ele assume o homúnculo em outro nível, né? Yeah. I think that it, 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 I mean, he goes up with Nietzsche, reevaluation of values. So, you know, the, he himself does a lot of that. And even, even the, he, he argues with Nietzsche in a sense that for Nietzsche, the God is dead. For Jung is an issue of renewal of the image of God. So he, he doesn't follow this kind of intellectual trend of the Europe in the end of 19th century, but he is looking for something for the renewal of, of the God image. So that's the Abraxas and, and Fanes for him in the, in the Red Book. Obrigado, Renato. É, Luciana Chimenez, por favor. Mas, Silvester, super obrigada pela sua palestra. Além dela ter sido fácil de acompanhar, apesar de densa, é, foi linda, linda de se ver. É, e a minha pergunta é justamente com essa fala que se recuperou agora, do, que ele se, ele, ele, o Jung cumpriu a sua própria profecia, praticamente, e tornou-se um artista incompreendido. Se eu bem entendi, foi isso que você falou no final daquela sua primeira parte da palestra. É, e aí eu fiquei pensando nessa frase, me surgiram duas perguntas a partir dela. A primeira... É, Veio, veio é, é, a partir do livro que do Sonu com o Hillman, aquela entrevista, é, O Lamento dos Mortos, né? e que o, o, num, num dos momentos lá eles falam da, é, que os artistas são arautos, são mensageiros de algo. Né? Uhum. E aí a minha pergunta é, é, um artista, na sua opinião, um artista 
pode ser compreendido, né? Existe uma compreensão possível para um artista? E a segunda pergunta, a partir ainda dessa fala, é, será que o Jung não caiu, vamos dizer assim, numa uma certa estratégia da ânima? E ele cumpriu a sua, a, o seu daimon. Não é que... Não sei se você citou a palavra erro, né? E eu fiquei pensando nisso. Será que foi um erro? Ou será que a ânima conseguiu o que ela queria com o Jung? Entende? Sim. Yeah. Uh -huh. Ah, no, the, 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 it's an interesting question that uh, uh, if, if we consider now from the, from the basically 100 years uh, period, you know, kind of hindsight, looking at Jung on this, whether, whether uh, if he stayed with the anima more in, in some sense, and, and, and Sonia so far did not find yet Uh, you know where this dialogue, because this dialogue is not in the in the in the uh, re, in the black, black books. In black books, Jung only says this is in the volume two on page I just recently found 174. This must have been happening at the time when this dialogue was was happening on the 16th of December 1913. Jung says just in a kind of passing at ending of one of the fantasies, "Ha, a work of art." Damn stop, that arrow hit the target. Where did it come from? So that's the only mentioning of that. So now if, 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 if this was, uh, you know, the artist for Jung carried that value, if somehow, you know, you, if Jung was, let's say, this, this spiritual art that I, I was talking about, if Jung saw that, I wonder whether he would see that this is artist's contribution to that wholeness in a way. The, the way, because he mostly focused on the Cubist, Picasso and so on, which is more fragmentation, rather than, let's say, you know, obviously the Hilma of Clint was not known at that time because he didn't, she didn't exhibit, but her attitude, interesting enough, is very parallel to what Jung was doing. Also in the sense that she kept it in her will not to exhibit the paintings until, you know, 20 or something years after she dies. So, but she was in, she had 125 notebooks of, of, of her uh, dialogues with the, in, these inner figures and the inner figures were literally directing her to paint in particular way. The reason I brought the Sigmund Polker quote that that's how she was a medium. So in, in a, the particular advisors would tell her, take this size of canvas exact. I mean, like you, what color to use? I mean, like very precise, talking about channeling, you know. So the art, I mean, there was a process going around 10 of the century that this was happening. Jung did his, did his dissertation on, on his cousin that was a medium. And that was the beginning of his kind of, you know, introduction to this thing. So that was the kind of a 19th century entertainment. Jung and Freud all go went to these sort of seances and they tried to understand what, what the hell is happening. And here's this, for Jung, the 15-year-old girl that suddenly speak with the wisdom of the ages. How this could happen? So this was his sort of uh, understanding with the complex idea. But something then... He himself finds that these things, in some sense, right through him, according to Sonia. It's more, Jung was not sort of speaking, but through writing, right? Not writing, first having a vision and then writing. It was kind of simultaneous, it's more automatic writing than, you know, kind of vision. And after the fact, he uh, sort of narrated it. So if If, if Jung was more aware of how the artistic process look at the time, that maybe his attitude would be somewhat different. Would be, it wouldn't be so, so keeping aside from, from the artistic value of this. But perhaps it was, it was not possible because then you would be sort of taken more towards the artistic understanding, which would be different than psychological understanding. And now, I mean, because 
we, I don't think we need to guard so much against this sort of separation. We can, we can value both, you know, in, in, in similar way that there, there is a psychology in art, not in a sense of psychologizing art, but something symbolic, you know, the creative instinct is being manifested there the same way that it's manifested in dreams or, you know, any sort of uh, fantasy experiences of people. Obrigado, Lu. vamos contigo? Olá, muito obrigada, mas a minha pergunta foi respondida agora, através da pergunta da Luciana. Então, obrigada, Olá. viu? Foi sensacional essa, essa conversa com você hoje. E eu só queria falar uma coisa, se essa questão também dele ter um modelo de totalidade, Sim. e aí a arte moderna não responder a esse modelo, porque ela é fragmentada, como ele via, né? Se, é, se ele estava naquele momento tentando provar algo e por não conseguir, ele não considerava a arte moderna como arte. Só queria que você comentasse isso rapidamente, porque o restante a Luciana já perguntou. Não, as you know, Jung, Jung is deeply into the quaternity, you know, the four, the opposites. I mean, everything he liked, the sort of nice circles and so on. So that, for him, that sort of the, at least the fragmented part of, of modern art does not provide the, the you know, the, basically even forms of that. Everything is sort of scattered and so on. So, so it, it, it I think if he, he saw Now, it's interesting because, mind you, he was in 1913 in New York when there was a very important armory show of the modern art from Europe at that time. And he writes, you know, he saw the, 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 the nude descending the staircase, the Duchamp painting, and he writes a very profound understanding of it in terms of time, space, and so on. And, and so he can see things. You know, but even then, he and also at that, there's Kandinsky's paintings there and so on. And he apparently, to to uh, 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 to, to some historians who studied that period, he attends quite a few kind of uh, artistic parties in the village of that time. So he actually hang out with some of the artists. So I so he maybe he was exposed somewhat to the ideas about the spiritual abstract art and. Uh, however, there is no, uh, I don't know whether the, in his library, let's say the Kandinsky uh, is on the spiritual art is, is I, I couldn't, couldn't check that yet, whether, but uh, uh, Jay Shea is saying that, that he might have been actually exposed. So maybe there was a some more conscious choice that he, again, wanted to be more into psychology than in art, I would say that. But as you know, the, the Jung, in terms of the uh, academia, is only accepted in the art, uh, sort of in the art, art history somewhat, and literature. Psychology is a footnote. Jung is a footnote to Freud or to Asens about the psychological types, and that's it. The college kids, at least in the States, don't, don't know anything about Jung. Because it's so, you know, old and, and you know, Not interesting anymore, seemingly. So, thank you. Maria thank da... you very much. Silva, é, é, nós temos hoje alguns nomes dentro do campo linguiano que fazem um trabalho diretamente ligado à questão da arte. Você mencionou o Francesco, o Dom Francesco, me lembrei do Christian Gailar, na França. Rafael Lopes Pedraza, yes. que escreveu um belo texto sobre Anselmo Kiefer, o seu próprio yes. trabalho. Você acha que a gente yes. poderia dizer que existe hoje uma teoria junguiana sobre a arte? Ou uma leitura junguiana sobre a arte? É uma escola, uma escola junguiana que pensa a arte enquanto fenômeno? É, seria possível dizer que isso existe?
No, I think that, you know, one evidence is this art of C.G. Jung, that publication that has uh, Jung's a lot of uh, reproductions of Jung paintings, that the family, I mean, Jung's family, that's sort of its, its custodian of that, recognizes it. You have the, there have been like four already conferences of art and psyche, in which, in which both the Jungians and other psychoanalysts and the artists come together to kind of develop more of a dialogue. So there is a, some, I would say, interpenetrations of the artists and the psychologists with the recognition that something, and some let's say about the process of the fantasy or the process how the unconscious works. You know, uh, in the, uh, I, I did also some work on the, on the Federico Fellini Fellini had an uh, enormous capacity for fantasy and so on. And on the, on the set of his films, he would allow for accidents to happen. So the, the things that the unconscious was manifested. And obviously when you have like hundred people on the set with different functions, so a lot of mistakes gets made, but he would allow it to enter the picture, so to speak. So the, 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 and I think there's a more of, of uh, uh, openness generally in the Jungian world towards recognition of the uh, sort of the artistic. However, I am not, because I mean, the Jung world, uh, Jungian world, as you know, is rather diverse and there are different sort of, not even schools, but you know, everybody is too individuated for their own good sometimes, I think. But there is a trend also towards the materialistic aspect, towards the neuroscience. Which, which tries to locate all these things with some kind of a brain neurotransmitters ideas. And that's sort of, that's the spirit of the time manifestation of the, what I consider, you know, more limiting to the imagination than let's say moving towards artistic side. And that's almost like for me, it's like kind of balancing out, you know, there's a part of the Jungians that are trying to find out, you know, how the complexes may work in the neuronal sort of structures, you know, almost like computer modeling of the, of, the, of the complexes. And on the other hand is more, let's say, openness towards artistic, which definitely, you know, if you look at the, at the processes, people who work with the, uh, with the sand, uh, sandbox therapy, which is some forms of expression, there's not much interpretation. You just kind of witness how the person works. People who work with authentic movement they are just sitting there witnessing person moving. They don't interrupt, they don't interpret what happened. <coughs> they just witness. So there's, there is the, and these are forms of expressions that would you call, you know, active imagination, but there, there is an openness to, to that kind of, to, to basically witness the process, let it flow without, you know, and Jung has some statements about that, you know, hold back the interpretation. The interpretation is not maybe necessary even. That the, it's better to take the figures for what they are, not what they may mean. And the whole debate, you know, if you if you look at the debate between K, in particular in the in the in the black books, between the K and Philemon. So Philemon Jung associates in his interpretive part with meaning and K with expression. And so, you know, and the Kai is somehow a shadow of Philemon. So they're both there. And, and, and so there's this dynamic that both have to be present. Not that the meaning obscures the expressions versus the, the, the allowing it because some, the whole idea of image versus symbols so that this debate in the Jungian world, that, that somehow the symbol is basically something behind something, you know, symbol lane. I mean, this is a Greek word for the bringing things together that were fallen apart. So that's the wholeness in it on one level, but on another level is the image presents what it presents, not it's what's behind it, what it symbolizes, it symbolizes itself. So, I mean, I'm from that sort of school of the archetypal psychology that focusing more on archetypal image rather than the archetype per se. We can have a couple Sylvester. of questions. I am okay. If that's... Vamos para a última pergunta, pode ser? Yeah, yeah, I agree. 
Arthur. Yeah, we can have a couple. I mean, I don't know how your schedule is. I'm, you know, I'm in a COVID situation, so I'm. <laughs> então, então, duas perguntas, duas perguntas. Vamos lá, Arthur e depois Luiz. Okay. Arthur, contigo, por favor. Valeu. É... Parabéns aí à organização, parabéns à palestra do professor Silvestre. É... Arthur, Arthur, espera só um pouquinho para ele. Legal, vai lá. Ok. Assim, são, eu não sei nem se eu consegui realmente fazer uma pergunta, mas me provocou muitas reflexões. E uma delas ficou essa, entre essa tensão entre arte e natureza. É, eu acho que ficou claro assim, uh -huh. né, que o Jung traz uma postura ética muito forte. Né? Então, a penitência de Fausto, né, que ele tenta quase que trazer para ele essa questão, uhum. né? Da mesma forma com que tem o um assassinato do Siegfried também, que parece ser um, um tema semelhante, né? Quer dizer, lidando com a inflação do ego, né? É, então, parece que ele opta por um, um caminho uhum. que há uma prioridade da ética, né? Aí eu fico pensando, será que a arte, nesse sentido, que houve essa discussão com a alma, não estaria representando uma postura um pouco mística, mística no sentido de daquilo que não pode ser comunicável, né? apesar de arte ser uma expressão, né? mas nesse contexto que ele discute com a ânima. Né? E a natureza seria um modo de, de funcionamento, né? quer dizer, por que, que o Jung se esforça por ir para ir em direção à natureza. Né? Seria a natureza um modo de funcionamento que funciona por etapas né? e que independe do ego né? e, e que, portanto, nos leva a um modo de funcionamento ético também, né? uma ética que não parte do ego, mas uma ética que se expressa pelas demandas. É... Né? Porque, no final das contas, o, o Jung está tentando lidar com uma questão de uma modernidade, digamos assim, adoecida, né? E parece... Enfim, eu fiquei pensando nessa tensão arte-natureza. Não, I mean, I agree with you with regard to the sort of the illness of modernity that Jung keeps struggling in there. You know, as you know, Jung considered creative aspect creative is an instinct for him so it's an instinctual expression in that sense it is natural in the, in, in his essay on this and um, psychology and poetry he he talks about the poem a poem as a plant so the, the the metaphor is natural so it happens naturally now somehow so for him he's closer to art as being nature than culture So with this now, so the, the, I guess whether because of natural, if, if it's a natural thing for him, it doesn't, like the nature is, you know, the volcanoes erupting, killing thousands of people, nature doesn't care. So that the nature for him does not have an ethical imperative somehow, that this is, this is just what it is, you know, animal eats animals and humans, you know, human kill each other. So if it, we take it just naturally, that would not have the ethical thing, as if he, on the other hand, when he talks about, you know, archetypal ideas, obviously the justice, let's say, or sense of injustice is an archetypal form. It is, it's coming from the unconscious as well. And it does not exclude, uh, you know, that, that looking at the natural event, that we can, uh, you know, see that this is a, horrible thing that happens during the tsunami or something like that, because in the our unconscious are other factors that are uh, uh, in some sense are able to ethically judge the, the just spontaneous expressions in a way. So I think that's, that's, the, that's the sort of this atti attitude towards the natural. I am more from the position that art is culture So it comes from the already basically from the tradition of expressions. The nature is already transformed from the, by the human soul, 
going back to the you know early rituals and to the cave paintings and so on for the for the civilizations that that it's like the way the let's say the the natural process when it comes to the for the animals and plants that creates one form of expressions of the animal and plant behavior but when the same process comes to human that leads to the expression in uh, one of them is art religion science and so on in a sense the same spirit that informs the the creation if you wish and the humans are a special has a special effect on human different let's say he talks a lot about as you know you know the the uh, ritualistic an animal dances of the birds you know building a particular bower you know nest very you know very aesthetically kind of pleasing so it, it that that factor is there So we have one more question. Too. Obrigado, Arthur. Hey, Luisa, está aí, Luisa? Obrigado. Obrigado, Arthur. Luisa, está aí, Lu? Oi, Arthur. Você quer Olá. ler? Não, quero que você fale. Tá bom. Vou tentar... <risos> Vou pegar minha colinha aqui para não confundir muito. Primeiro, obrigada. Adorei a, a palestra. Muito bom ouvi-lo. Já tinha lido muitas coisas. Gostei muito. E, e eu queria saber assim, eu acho que primeiro o Jung tem essa certa negação de, é, de assumir que é arte, ou de, de se dizer é, que ele estava fazendo arte de alguma forma ali, e depois mesmo que ele tenha tido aproximações um pouco mais simpáticas à arte moderna, de modo geral ele fala bastante mal, assim, né? ele nega um pouco essa, essa arte moderna e, e ter o aspecto estético, né, como você falou. E eu queria saber se isso acaba levando é, uma articulação da psicologia analítica, acho que até hoje, né, não só lá no Jung, com a arte que acaba se voltando muito para os temas e se torna, acho que, às vezes, muito conteudista e estagnada, não leva muito em conta, é, assim, um pouco preocupado, como se essas é, articulações estivessem muito voltadas a sobre o que a obra é não tanto considerando a arte como uma forma de ver e perceber o mundo, o próprio movimento dentro da arte ao longo da história, enfim. Queria saber um pouco sua opinião sobre isso. Obrigada. I think now with regard to, to the image per se, an artistic image is one of the images in a way that generally we need more patience, I would say, to let the image work on us. So in a sense that if you go to the museum and now it's kind of interesting in New York because there are limited number of people that are allowed because of the corona. So actually you can enjoy, you know, without the crowds looking at the painting, let's say, And, and that the same way when something comes to us, in the, for, you know, from the fantasy image or from the dream image, rather than moving quickly towards interpretation, towards meaning, what it means to appreciate it, to be with it, even let's say now paint it or express it in some form to, to give it more value, to, to just and, and quote unquote, sit, with it, sit with it. So when the patient, let's say, presents the dream, to inquire more about the test so you can see in your own mind what the, the images were rather than kind of assume in, immediately going down towards the, you know, or oh, that means that kind of attitude. Rather than valuing, I think we need attention and with the attention deficit disorder in the culture as such, to, to pay attention to the single thing, to the image of something that you're attracted to in art or whatever, and just being with it. I think that's that's that has a value because otherwise we'll be distracted. You know, I I grew up more in a print culture. Remember, there was a saying that the that the picture is worth it's worth thousands of words. Now, picture is not even worth a word because it's so available. I mean, the culture is imagistic in the sense of the, you know, now we have all images even on the screen. It, 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 there's something happens to the, to the attention that we devote to the, to the single manifestation of something. We have to move something to the, you know, what does it mean and move on, move on, like where are we going? 
It's about connection, about, you know, relating, engaging what manifests itself, and that takes time. Otherwise, we're just sort of, you know, clicking on the, I did it, I did it, you know, I done it, and, you know. Okay, thank you everyone for having me, obrigado. Obrigada. Silvestre, yeah. vou tomar a liberdade de te fazer uma última pergunta. Pode ser? É... Sure. Okay. <risos> ok. A gente conversou que você... Você estava em, Jeru... em Israel, né? Em Jerusalém. Agora você está em Nova York. Você não consegue voltar porque Israel está fechado com os aeroportos. É... E eu me lembrei uh -huh. de um texto que você escreveu sobre monstros e dragões. E aí eu te pergunto, a gente vai vencer uhum. esse dragão do Covid? Esse monstro do Covid, a gente vai vencê-lo? <risos> we have to talk to it. Remember, in the, my, on the, the construction of the monster, which is about to listen to the dragon. Now, I consider what's happening is that the, we are being ruled now by the invisible uh, crown, the virus, the corona, the crown, the virus. And it has tremendous power of affecting even political structures. I, 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 you may know uh, uh, French anthropologist, philosopher Bruno, Bruno Latour who is, you know, he, he is right now very much into, into climate science and so on. So he, he says that, that one thing that he was quite surprised, and this was, in, in, he said it about, Ju, you know, uh, May, June last year, that the, the, the actual, the corona was able to, to bring something to the, to the political social dimension that seemed to be inconceivable before. So he takes it that this is an almost a kind of pre-staging preparation for the climate impact. That the politically, if we can bring the restrictions, you know, politically to the, to the whole society, given that threat of this sort of the invisible other penetrating everyone, that maybe there is some hope that we'll be able politically to enact some restrictions with regard to the to the climate changes that are you know coming as we speak so the, the, i think there is in that way that there's a potentially something now now the you know even we call about pandemic the pan all the god pan and demos and people so it's a panic among people and you, you look how differently different both the cultures countries, people respond to the invisible, which is basically paranoid threat. You know, the, the, this, is, this is concretization of like, you know, I don't know what hits me, what is dangerous and, and so on. So I have to protect myself and look what happens. We create now universal rituals, distancing, masks, hand washing, you know, compulsive hand washing, or obsessive compulsive, you know, symptom. But, but, you know, the way I imagine the cultures of the past, when, when everybody, let's say, agreed that the, that's how you worship the God, and that's how this event is a manifestation of Zeus, or, or, or let's say, they stay with the Greek mythology, or Athena, or something like that, you just follow the, the rights. You follow the particular way of playing, paying sacrifices. And now we are doing this to this little virus that it's not even a, you know, a, a life form. It needs us to multiply. And, and, and we are respecting it with this sort of approach. That instead of you know, me visiting you in Brazil, now we are talking for the you know, pixelated screens. That's the impact of, of, the, of this invisible threat. Now, whether this will, we, 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 we can overcome these monsters, maybe the monster is us, you know. Maybe that, you know, that we are in a sense destroying the planet and, and the planet is defending itself, sending out, you know, those kind of, you know, creatures to, you know, 
if you take the Gaia hypothesis that there is some kind of a balancing homeostasis, who knows, maybe, you know, too many humans, you know, for, for the planet's good. All right. Aguardemos. Aguardemos. <laughs> Silvestre, muito obrigado pela sua okay. disponibilidade. Foi um prazer te receber. É uma, uma alegria grande compartilhar com os nossos, os nossos colegas brasileiros teu trabalho, tua leitura, tua ótica. É, que você volte bem para Israel, que você consiga tomar a vacina, que você fique bem e tomara que a gente possa se ver novamente em breve. Muito obrigado pela tua participação aqui. Um abraço. Ha, <laughs> ha,